Hello there. Have you ever wondered whether you have any legal rights in an image that you post to Twitter or Facebook? Or why only the Coca-Cola company is allowed to call its soda Coke, but Pepsi can use Coke products in their commercials? Have you ever wondered what a patent is? Do you want to be able to advise your clients on how to protect their intangible assets from ideas to website designs to names and more? If so, Introduction to Intellectual Property Law is for you. My name's Jason Rantanen, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the course, particularly what intellectual property law is, why it's useful for all lawyers to know something about IP, and the learning objectives for the Introduction to Intellectual Property course. This short video will cover each of these topics. Intellectual property law is the law governing legal rights in ideas, information, creative expression, and other creative intangibles. A creative intangible is what we sometimes use to refer to things that are both human created and which exist outside the purely physical. That might sound like philosophical mumbo jumbo, so let me give you a few examples. One form of creative intangible that we often deal with are books. While a book can be a tangible thing, like this one, it also has an intangible aspect, the words or illustrations on the pages. That's the creative intangible, what the book says rather than a particular physical copy of the book. A song provides a similar example. While it's possible to write notes on a sheet of paper or record a song to a cassette, the song itself is intangible. It exists independently from a particular physical copy of it. Another common example of a creative intangible is technology. For example, this light bulb. What makes this light bulb valuable is the knowledge of how it works, how to make more light bulbs, and how to use it to generate light. The light bulb, not this specific light bulb, but the concept of a light bulb is a creative intangible. Here's yet another example of a creative intangible. It's pretty simple, just a swoosh. And yet, this symbol is incredibly potent. You saw it and thought, Nike, or this one. Just a piece of fruit with a bite out of it, right? And yet it instantly calls to mind Apple, the company. Both of these symbols tell you the source of a good or service, and both are forms of creative intangibles. All of these creative intangibles have legal rights associated with them. Nike and Apple have legal rights in their symbols. Edison had legal rights in the incandescent bulb and authors and artists have legal rights in their songs and books. And these are just a few examples of creative intangibles. Client databases, recipes, Google's algorithms, photographs, sculptures, and more can all have legal rights associated with them. These legal rights come from intellectual property laws, which exist at both the federal and state level. There are a few core forms of legal rights that the law defines in creative intangibles. Copyrights for creative expression, such as songs, books, and movies. Patents for new and useful technologies. Trade secrecy for information that businesses need to share with employees and contractors. And trademarks for word symbols and other devices that identify the source of a good or service. And of course, rights of publicity, which govern the commercial legal rights a person has in their identity. Now you know a bit about intellectual property. So why study it further, especially if you're not planning on specializing in intellectual property law? The most basic reason is because many of your clients, especially business clients, 
are going to have some kind of intellectual property law issue and you're going to need to advise them. A large portion of a business's value today is in the form of its creative intangibles. This extends beyond entertainment companies in Silicon Valley. Almost every company today has to think about how it uses intellectual property law to protect its own intangible assets and avoids violating the intellectual property rights of others. Knowing the fundamentals of intellectual property law will enable you to spot issues for your clients and help them avoid legal pitfalls that could be costly down the road. It will also make you better prepared to negotiate on behalf of your client, secure their legal rights, and if necessary, argue in court. Now you might be wondering whether intellectual property law is just for STEM majors. The answer is it's not. While there is some technology involved in intellectual property law, the level we'll be studying it at in Introduction to Intellectual Property is about the same level as many of your other classes. In torts, you likely studied trains, planes, and automobiles, while in contracts, you may have examined issues with click-through contracts. In property, you might have read about and discussed how property law reacts to claims of ownership in cells and genetic information. In Introduction to Intellectual Property, you'll read about who owns the legal rights in Prince's guitar, trade secrets in the sports drink industry, restaurant decor, and since it's Iowa, soybeans. In short, a science or technology background isn't necessary to take Introduction to Intellectual Property, although a curiosity about how innovation and creativity shapes and is shaped by the law always helps. Introduction to Intellectual Property has five learning outcomes. By the end of this course, you will be able to explain the laws governing creative intangibles, especially copyrights, trade secrets, patents, trademarks, and rights of publicity at a foundational level. This means that you'll know the constitutional, statutory, and judicial law relating to these concepts, and will be able to explain that law to someone else. Because this is an introductory course, you won't necessarily know every detail and nuance of the law, but you will know the fundamentals and where you would go to learn more. By the end of this course, you'll also be able to explain the justifications commonly raised in support of and against granting legal rights in creative intangibles. You may have studied some of these justifications in property law or tort law, and others may be new to you. It's also important to understand that rights have limits, particularly when they conflict with the rights of others. Throughout this course, you will apply different lenses to the contours of intellectual property law. In addition, by the end of this course, you'll be able to analyze factual scenarios under the laws governing creative intangibles. This starts with spotting the intellectual property issues in a set of facts, then identifying the relevant law and applying it to those facts to predict an outcome or argue a position. You will also be able to analyze the consequences of an intellectual property rule. Beyond these core intellectual property outcomes, this course will also help you further develop your ability to read and explain statutory text using standard tools of statutory interpretation, and to be able to apply legal reasoning to statutory law and judicial precedent, two of Iowa Law's learning outcomes for the JD degree. During the spring 2021 semester, we'll be doing things a little differently than in the past. Lectures will be delivered primarily through videos like this one, so that you can watch the lectures at your own pace. Readings and lectures will be accompanied by short quizzes and icon to make sure that everyone is on the same page before coming to class. These quizzes will be graded based on completion. Class meetings will be devoted primarily to discussions of statutes and cases, analysis of hypotheticals, and conversations about the consequences of different legal rules. 
we'll be using a variety of different mechanisms to keep everyone engaged. Now some things will be the same as in previous semesters. As in the past, we'll be using an open source casebook that I've developed. The digital copy of this casebook is free, or you can purchase a printed copy that's much less expensive than typical law school textbooks. And as usual in law classes, there'll be a final exam that'll be heavily weighted in your final course grade. But don't get too focused on grades. The ultimate goal of this class is to ensure that everyone who takes it obtains a knowledge and understanding of intellectual property law. If you'd like to learn more about the material that'll be covered in Introduction to Intellectual Property, or take a look at the course policies, you can find them at the location that's linked here on the screen. With that, I'd like to thank you for watching this short introductory video, and I hope to see you in the spring semester.